Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Baird, and I'm one of the student welfare workers here at Heathdale. Uh, I'm currently just with my best friend and son, Jedediah. Say good morning. Here we go. This last week, I've been reading through Mark chapter 5. That's obviously our uh, chapter for the week, and I've had so many different thoughts come through at different times and at different places. I thought I'd therefore sit down, have a think, and write down all these thoughts that have been coming to me. And something that's really stood out from uh, in particularly verses 1 to 20, is that God is the God of the individual. That's right, God is the God of the one. So um, I sat down and I, I wrote this out, and uh, I'm going to read it to you now. But once again, this devotion is called The God of the Ones. There is a repeated sub-narrative throughout the scriptures which is intended to capture the hearts of its readers. That which astonishes me most is this, that despite the complex multi-layered nature of scripture, the authors of the Bible repeatedly show how God the Father purposefully engages with individuals to achieve his covenantal ends. As I sit here and contemplate, several key characters come to mind. God purposefully pursued and engaged with Noah, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Hannah, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jonah, and Hosea. Whilst this list is definitely not comprehensive, when one studies one of the lives of these characters, we see a God who purposefully goes out of his way to engage with the individual. The end goal of these encounters is always personal transformation or exhortation for the purpose of communal and covenantal salvation. In many aspects, God pursues an individual to change the course of peoples, tribes, and nations. Now, Hebrews 1 verse 3 tells us that Jesus Christ is the exact representation of God the Father. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that we see Jesus following the same blueprint of engagement. Some of the individuals Jesus pursued was the woman at the well who had lived a complex life, the Syrophoenician woman whose child was sick, Zacchaeus, that short man who once climbed a tree, and Mary Magdalene, a woman with a troubled past. In parable form, it was the one lost son, the one coin, and of course the one lost sheep. Yet there is one character from this week's passage which astonishes me most, and that is the man who lived among the dead, known as Legion. Prior to this encounter, we read of Jesus' extraordinary rise in popularity. In the first five chapters of Mark's Gospel, we read of the many hordes of people that surrounded Jesus. A local boy from Galilee had begun healing the sick, casting out foreign spirits, and preaching the kingdom of God with authority. And like a moth to a flame or ant to a sugar bowl, people flocked to Jesus in their thousands. There is no doubt that if Jesus wanted to incite an insurrection against the Romans or the Jewish leaders, he could have easily. Yet it appears that Jesus was not phased by the gushing crowds. Nowhere in scriptures do we read of Jesus soaking up the praises of the many, nor purposefully seeking their admiration. If anything, we see a Christ who repeatedly and purposefully withdrew from the masses. This would appear as something unusual to the modern reader, as it no, as it no does to the historical reader. In our world, which is full of the desire for likes and subscriptions and admiration, Jesus avoided attention and fame like the plague. Rather, in his holy providential desired, desire, Jesus, like his father, sought out the ones. Jesus crossed the waters. Leaving the familiar region of Galilee, Jesus crossed over the waters. Whenever Jesus crossed the waters of the Great Lake, it almost always symbolised a shift in his ministry. Jesus' lake crossings were never incidental. Rather, they indicated a purposeful decision for engagement. Jesus purposefully got into the boat at that moment, and with the assistance of God's wind, he purposefully travelled over to the largely Gentile region of the Decapolis. Jesus purposefully crossed the waters to engage with one man. The disciples may have been wondering why they were even here in the first place, especially considering the fame they had attracted back in Galilee. The lead disciples were local fishermen who knew this 
very lake inside out. They knew exactly where they were. One could even picture Peter and his younger colleague John scouting out this area in years gone by, perhaps even taunting the madman who was chained to the tombstones. Yet here in Mark 5, 1-20, we see Jesus' desire to purposefully engage with the one who was shunned and tormented. Immediately, when Jesus' feet touched the shore, a deranged and derelict man approached him. The exchange started quite abruptly. Verse 2 tells us that the man came out of the tombs to meet him. One would be in significant error to think Legion's approach was dainty or polite. You know, much like a happy grade 2 student meeting you in the morning. Rather, Jesus and his ragtag team of disciples were greeted by the living dead. This man was cut from head to toe. After all, one does not simply break change without damaging skin. To make matters worse, this man was naked, most likely smelly, out of his right mind, and a chronic self-harmer. What a way to be greeted. Surely Jesus had landed on the wrong foreshore at the wrong time of day. If God the Almighty wills all things, then surely this was a significant oversight. What do you want with me, the spirits cry. Here we see the demons and this man are one. I really love it how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. My name is Mob. I am a rioting mob. Yet, Jesus may have looked perplexed at this kind of comment, for he had just escaped the admiration of the mob. Once again, Jesus could have used the mob for fame, power, money, and lusts. Yet Jesus did not see the mob in this man. He saw the one. Our God, ladies and gentlemen, is the God of the ones. With one word, the mob left the man and entered the symbol of uncleanliness, swine. According to God, unclean spirits belong in unclean things, not in a son of Adam, the son of God. With one divine word, one man was changed for one mission. Yes, of course, Jesus could have bypassed the tombs for the village. Yes, Jesus could have healed and transformed that entire village. Yet our God is the God of the ones. In his providence, God chose to restore one broken, abused man to show his grace and power to the many. In turn, a man dressed and in his right mind, his eternal soul still glowing from the encounter with Christ, would in turn minister to the whole village about the work that God had done. Perhaps God's life motto is work smarter and not harder. Why not engage with and transform the lowest despised and scary person and make them into an asset for the kingdom of heaven and set them loose in mission to reach the many? Let us remember that the very heart of the triune God is to purposefully go out of his way to engage with the ones. Not necessarily the clean, respectable, obedient or faithful ones. Rather, Scripture paints a continual picture of the God who actively and purposefully seeks and saves those who are lost. Whilst we may never know Ludron's true name, we do know that God purposefully showed him grace. The essence of the Christian life, friends, is to be like Jesus Christ. If you and I are truly in Christ, the Spirit of God will give us a heart to go after the ones too. Not necessarily those who are worthy and have it all together. Instead, we are called to pursue those who are on the fringe, those who are socially outcast, the mentally unstable, the foreigner, the widow, orphan or poor. Perhaps the one God wants you to engage with sits in your classroom daily. The one who keeps you up at night worrying. The one who takes up a lot of your emotional and professional energy. Or the one you perhaps even despise. 
Maybe your one is sitting here in this room. That one colleague you have been avoiding for months. A person you just can't stand to reconcile with. May I encourage you to seek out your one. The one person who needs the love of God. A person who needs to hear of God's grace. So as I finish up, and as I was doing some more research during the week, I learned that in the 20th century, a bulldozer was excavating some land outside Tallakersey in the western parts of Jordan, an area on the slopes of the Lake of Galilee, traditionally held to be the site of Christ's encounter with Legion. Here the gentleman stumbled across some ancient ruins. After notifying the officials, archaeologists surveyed and studied the area. But what they uncovered was sections of an ancient town. Now at the centre of this town was a monastery, a large church with a chapel. It has been noted that this town was a functioning religious town during the Middle Ages. Yet what was noted was building works underneath the chapel. Underneath the chapel, what is thought to be an original church dating back to the 1st or 2nd century. This means that this Gentile town that originally shooed Jesus away eventually became a Christian village with a church. But Jesus didn't minister to the people of the Gerasenes, and there is no indication that any of the 12 disciples did either. That means that this town was transformed by... This means that this town was transformed by one man who was once possessed by 3,000 demons in him, who lived among the dead and whose body was torn to pieces. Yet one encounter with one Lord empowered one mission to save one town. Perhaps Paul is correct when he pens, Oh, the depth and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of God or who has been his counsellor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him? And through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory. Amen. Thank you.